Um, what you're seeing here is a medical. It's not a hospital. It's an aid station. We are the first medical people that a wounded soldier coming off the field would would meet up with. We're only 50 to 200 yards behind the battle line. What are we going to do? We are going to triage the patients that come in. Notice I don't call them soldiers anymore. They're patients when they come into my aid station. Uh, we're going to triage them. Now, if you are at a regular modern emergency room, if you go into an emergency room and maybe you have a really badly infected hangnail or something like that, and you sign in and they tell you it's going to take a while. Uh, and you look around and there's a guy with a broken leg and another guy is probably having a heart attack and a stroke over here. So you, you probably figure out where you're going to be on that list of being seen. Probably last, right? We do the least serious wounds first. Just the opposite. We're going to have more than a hundred wounded come through. Two surgeons. This is an assistant surgeon right here. He has been certified by the U.S. Army's uh, medical board as a surgeon. Uh, he's come here to do some extra training on, on battlefield wounds. And he's going to be helping me out. So, um, let's do a thing. We're going to do a little quiz, folks. All right, well, this is called Truth or Myth, and let's see what we have here. we go. I'm going to make a statement, and you are going to tell me whether it is true or false. Okay, this is just a true or false quiz. You ready, guys? Soldiers bit the bullet during the Civil War. During true. operations. True? True? true. 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 That's nah, false. <laughs> it's strictly Hollywood. Folks. Still, it's too many old we have, we have, ether and chloroform. Both came onto the pharmacology in 1848. It's an anesthetic. We can knock them out. So no, they didn't have antibiotics and sulfa drugs were available during the Civil War. Truth or myth? myth. It is a myth. They weren't developed until the 1930s, 70 years later. Most leg wounds received amputation. Do we lop off their leg with every leg wound? No. That is a myth. It had to have, the bullet had to have shattered the bone. And it took two physicians and, or two surgeons to agree that amputation needed to be done. Second opinion. Bingo. Most of the wounds were to the arm and the leg during the Civil War. Truth or myth? I'm going to go, yeah. That is true. Especially in the beginning when they were still using a lot of smooth board muskets. You didn't know where that ball was going to go. It was like throwing a knuckleball. They go up and down and over and then drop down real fast. So you could aim at a guy's head and he might be hit in the knee. No. Oh. True. Whiskey was the main painkiller during the Civil War. Truth or myth? Myth. I have one correct answer, and that is myth. <laughs> we had morphine and opium. We had laudanum, which is a mixture of morphine and brandy. So, yeah, we had painkillers, and they were very effective for a certain period of time until, well, we've created a lot of opium addicts. They found a cure for that in the 1880s. They called it more. Uh, they called it uh, heroin. Yeah. yeah that's a great cure. Bullets killed more than disease during the Civil War. Is that correct? No. Yeah. You've been here before. Yeah. <laughs> that is a myth. Two thirds of the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who died during the Civil War died from disease, not connected with combat. 
There were over 750,000 who died. What was the most common disease? The most common was uh, chronic dysentery and typhoid fever. Uh, measles, measles and malaria both were up there. Mm. Doctors knew about the germ theory during the Civil War. Truth or myth? Mm. Kind of a trick question. The answer is true. They knew about it, they just didn't believe it. <laughs> Chest wounds were usually not fatal. Truth or myth? Yes. That's correct. Chest wounds and abdominal wounds were considered mortal wounds. The physician, the surgeon knew that if he opened up and did an operation in that area, that uh, infection would set in and then the patient would die anyway. Wounds that have laudable, no, we're not going to do that one. Oh, go well, ahead, it's a good one. All right, wounds that have laudable pus are bad. What's Truth or myth? What's laudable mean? Laudable means good. Good, good pus? Myth. Mm -hmm. Gotta be. Okay, during the Civil War, this is a myth. Laudable pus is good pus. To demonstrate, two guys were shot in the leg. They didn't have to have their legs amputated. So uh, they removed the bullets. The, the wounds were starting to heal. One of them was developing a pus on that. And pus is nothing more than, than dead and dying white blood cells. So this guy over here had pus on him on his wound. This guy didn't for some reason. Surgeon comes around, he looks, you know, who's rounds and he's looking and he says, well, this guy's got pus. Okay, so we're gonna pick this up and, you know, feel it, smell it, and if it's right, it's laudable pus. And he takes some of this and puts it over there on that guy's wound. Today we call it cross-contamination. Florence <laughs> Nightingale was a nurse in the Union Army during the Civil War. Truth or myth? With all Correct. It is a myth. Florence Nightingale was an English woman who was a nurse uh, during the Crimean War that the British were having in the 1840s. But she was a big influence to bring female nurses into into the fold. Civil War doctors used microscopes. Truth or myth? Yeah. No, it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they bought it, they had some, yeah. they had to buy some of their own equipment. So if they had it. Civil War doctors had thermometers during, in the field. Truth or myth? Myth. Yeah. That's true. True. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going we to. <clears throat> Chloroform and ether were not available in the South during the Civil War. Truth yeah. or myth? Myth. They had it. Mm -hmm. Truth. Maybe not as much. Both. As the uh, well, but it's cheap and easy to make. Mostly they do. Yeah. Yeah. Surgeons, no. <laughs> that one. The Confederate Surgeon General urged Southern citizens to plant poppies as a source of opium. Oh. Truth that's or myth? That sounds true. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's true. true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, well, you better get this one right. You better do this one. Women were better at sanitation than men in the hospitals. Absolutely. Truth or myth? Absolutely. Yeah, you'd better say truth. <laughs> uh, oh, this one is fun. Soldiers ate hardtack infested with maggots to increase their daily meat ration. Truth or myth? Uh, truth. Yeah, that's a, a trick question. It's a myth. Yes, no. they sometimes ate it with maggots, but that wasn't by choice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Last but not least, blue grass, also known as calomel, contained an amount of mercury that was a thousand times more than what is considered safe today. And Truth that was a or myth? Calomel was a medicine. And blue mass was a medicine. To treat. Uh, it was good to treat diarrhea and social diseases. Okay, that, by the way, is true. It was in 1863, I think, that they finally decided that calomel and blue mass with so much mercury in it was treating, was really doing a bad job on people. Doc, we've got okay. Andrew coming. Okay, I'm up there. Stabilize. 
the cable. Scooch downwards. Uh, and shot one? Yeah. Scooch down a little bit faster. Oh. Alright, I'm going to palpate this just to see. Not broken. Okay. Not broken. That's good. Oh, ah. Okay. Um, Benny says, uh, uh, relax, take it easy. I'm going to take a look inside under the bandage here. Walking away there. Is that hurting? Yeah. Okay. Good. Out of it over there. Is he going uh, to let's uh, let's give him two drops of ether. That'll give him a grade two. Used ether during the day. Couldn't use it at night because it's flammable. And so if you did surgery at night by candlelight, mm -hmm. you didn't want to quite off everybody. Keep breathing. So instead of ether, they would use chloroform. He has been rendered senseless. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's see what we can find here. It's a shallow wound. I used my I'll probe it. Okay. Hi. Oh. A couple of things in there. First, that's a 50, 58 caliber ball, or not round ball, it's a mini ball. But there's something else in there. <laughs> He's not feeling anything, by the way. All right. All right, the button. I don't know what happened to either. That, uh, his firing partner took the brunt of this. He took a shot right to, to the belly. That, that bullet hit that button first, went through the, his body and into this guy's leg. Doc, we got another one coming. Yeah, okay. What I need to do... Okay. Do you want okay, me I want you to go over there. No. Well, I do you want me to bring him around? Wake him up. Okay, uh, do you want a fresh it up. bandage? Bandage it up, fresh. Okay. Where are you? Okay. Doc? Yeah? I need a second opinion here. Okay. All right, buddy. How you doing? Let's move you to the ambulance. Okay. You'll go on to the field hospital uh, okay. and they'll keep an eye on it. Use the morphine powder right on right on the wound. Right on the That'll help out. That'll help with the brain down over there. <laughs> Abdominal wounds. I'll take him to the chest stage. wounds. Mortal so wounds. We can't do anything for them. We can make them comfortable. Would you that's all. What's coming up here now? I got a splinter in me, dog. Uh, all right, let's take a look. If you want a closer look, come closer. Okay. What do you need? Okay, well, that's, that's a big splinter. Let's uh, give him uh, two drops of ether. Am I gonna there, make it? you'll be, you're not gonna lose your leg. You are gonna, we're gonna fix this up. You'll be all fine. You'll be fine. You'll just be out of out of business for a little bit of time. Breathe deeply. <laughs> no. No. No, nurse. You know better than that. All right. A typical surgeon. <laughs> I just got kicked underneath the table here. <laughs> all right. I don't need scissors, no. Okay. Uh, not right now. Okay. Yeah, 
Right. He's been rendered senseless. Good. Okay. Let's go in here. Yeah, give me uh, some other types of scissors, the smaller ones. That work. Notice. Oh, no. Mess around too much because that just causes more damage and, and could cause an inflammation later on. Okay. Oh. Yeah. He's been under a tree a long time. Give me some tweezers. Thank you. Yep. There it is. Oh, two of them. Two maggots. Don't miss any. I'm not. Well, well, there's one or two, there's more. Yep, there's another one. Now, this, uh, actually, seeing maggots in this wound means he's been uh, under the tree for a while after he got wounded. The thing is, though, that, that maggots only eat dead flesh. So it's a fairly clean wound. All right. He might walk with a limp later on. I don't see any more. Okay. That's quite a splinter, isn't it? He was sitting under a tree somewhere. Solid shot hit that tree and the splinters came down and got him. Okay, just, uh, I'm not even gonna sew it up. I want some wet lint. You I'll pack that in there, that will keep that so it drains properly. Alright, bandage him up and get him to the ambulance. We will send these guys, uh, all of these patients who are surviving, first to a... Do you want me to bring them around? Yeah, wait a second. Wait a second. We're going to bring, we're going to send these by ambulance to the field hospital nine miles behind us. Can you use any kind of anything to sterilize the wound? Or? Why? Did they use anything? Nothing? No. Oh. It's a fairly clean wound. So, all right, wake him up. Uh. Let's get him to the ambulance. He will probably have a limp for the rest of his life, but he will have both of his legs. Mm -hmm. Now, with that first gentleman, first who had his uh, the button inside with the bullet, more than likely some kind of infection will come in. It could be gangrene. It could be a different type, and more than likely, he will lose part of his leg. When the doc took me to task, I just refused to tell him that the respect for nurses was gained when a surgeon found out he was about to get a whole bunch of new female nurses in the hospital. His reaction was, well, at least the floors will be clean. <laughs> the truth is, call went out for volunteers, and somewhere between seven and 10,000 women volunteered to be nurses. Some of them had gone along with their husband to make sure he was cared for. It is a European tradition that families went along. Husband may have died, she stayed on nursing. A wonderful story of Mother Bickerdyke, who, by the way, mother, is a term of endearment that the soldiers gave to the female nurses. Mother Bickerdyke went to a site and was to see a family member. When she got there, he had already passed. Now, 
what happened was she toured, if you will. You know that dysentery was a big killer of soldiers. It was rampant. You know, when you have horses camped here, people camp uh, the uh, cooks here, and you've got the rest of the soldiers down here. Not a good thing. So mother went to the tent, and I want you to think that that tent there could hold eight, up to eight men. It's got straw on the floor. She looks in, these men are filthy. The straw is so soiled that it goes down to the ground. She grabs a physician, uh, not a physician, she grabs a soldier and begins to complain bitterly about the conditions and demands that the straw be, the so, soldiers be taken out, cleaned, given clean clothing, that the straw be removed, and if it has seeped into the soil, dig down until the soil is clean. She demanded that new straw be put in, and most importantly, she demanded that a chamber pot be put in each one of those tents. Mother Bickerdyke went on to be a thorn in the side of many physicians and even uh, a general. Uh, someone came to a general, uh, not a general. Somebody came, came somebody to, went to a, a general. To complain bitterly about that woman. When asked who that woman was, was told that it was Mother Bickerdyke. At that point, the general said, See Sherman, she ranks me. <laughs> <laughs> Women made a huge step forward and made a huge difference. Uh, Dorothea Dix was given the job to recruit nurses. They primarily went into the regular standard hospitals. Um, but the number of women that served as nurses is big. And in the Confederacy, those who served as nurses risked being ostracized by their own family. It was unseemly to take care of a man who was not your family member. Any questions? Yes. Dysentery, yeah, it was amoebic dysentery. Um, as she said, well, to give you a little thing here, um, a little story. When an army comes into camp, who comes in first? Horseback. Cavalry comes in, sets up, and starts uh, setting up their camp, taking care of the horses. Then comes the artillery. They got horses too. They do the same thing. Then comes the infantry. And they come in, set up downstream from the horses. And they also set up their, their cooking uh, their mess tents and their latrines right next, right next to the creek. So that's the water they're cooking that's with. That's the water they're cooking and drinking and it's really easy to get this material. And often mercury or um, an opiate would be given to them to try and stop dysentery because opiates cause you to be constipated but it doesn't cure it. So what's, it can become chronic. What's important to remember, and it's so different, well, I shouldn't say that, it, it happened a, a while in modern medicine, but is, for most of us, is so different. Doctors during the Civil War did not treat a disease, they treated symptoms. So you could basically be getting things that do the other one. Exacerbating the problem, yeah. So, big difference. It makes a lot of difference in healing, too. Uh, malaria is a, one of the other, somebody had asked, one of the biggies. Depending on where they were fighting, malaria was a, a bad one. They knew almost nothing about caring. And first of all, how it started, but. Yeah. Or think how to fix think it. of it today. How does this one catch malaria? Mosquitoes. Today, that's true. During the Civil War, they didn't know that. They thought it was, it was they call it a miasma around uh, still water. And if you set up next to a swamp or a bog or something like that, sure, there are mosquitoes there. Yeah. 
but they weren't causing the problem. It was that bad air. Malaria just means that. It's two Latin words. Mal meaning bad, aria meaning air. It, and yeah, you know, it's flapping the skin is way like crazy, but that's not what's causing that. Yes? No. Not for a while. No. no. Ironically, <laughs> two things that make you go, they didn't make the connection. So in the Northeast, there was, there was particularly a, a hospital ship that was being used. And they were recruiting, and this is their word, refined women. The best explanation I can give you in modern terms, they wanted soccer moms. Because soccer moms knew how to organize, and in reality, in most cases, when the troops moved, the, any of the female nurses that were with them would go on ahead and set up a quick field hospital or a quick aid station or something like that. They were the first there to set it up in, in many cases. So they wanted somebody that knew how to organize. They also wanted somebody who had probably already treated everything they were going to see. And lastly, they wanted them because they knew the importance of cleanliness. The Confederates were the first to recognize the fact that hospitals that had female nurses, patients got better faster. Somehow the connection got lost <laughs> because it isn't until the 1870s that they start doing sterilized fields of surgery. Antiseptic surgery, it was called. Now, antiseptic surgery at that time was this. They would provide a fine mist of a very dilute carbolic acid all over the operating theater. theater. That means that not only were the instruments sterilized, but so was the wound, the patient, the surgeon, anybody else in the room, uh, even, even the people observing up in the, as an audience. They all got sterilized. They got better at it. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, very interesting. Honestly, if you think of a question after you've walked away, come back, we'll ask you, we'll answer it for you, or, oh, you forgot your... I forgot my number 11. Doctors were allowed... Wait, 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 wait. Surgeons worked up to 72 hours straight. After a certain period of time, your turn. <laughs> At every hour during that 36-ish hour, Time that he was up and about, he would be allowed one shot of whiskey because, of course, it makes him more awake. <laughs> it's a stimulant. It's I want to be patient one. How about you? Yeah, right. <laughs> By the way, that's tea. <laughs> but it, drugs were numbered because if they needed supplies and they were talking to Civil War soldiers who were going to get the supplies for them, they were offering illiterate. And so they did the drugs by numbers. So the surgeon or the mothers or something would say, we need more 11, we need more two, we need more six. And then the supply people would understand what they needed to. This is number 11, by the you way. You can see it's, it's had really a lot well of use. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the labels were in Latin. It's okay. Yes. yes, but you would not like their version of it. No, no, we did not do it before. Triage then is polar opposite of today. If you go into an ER today and you've got a nosebleed that just is not stopping, but suddenly someone, and you've been waiting there for 30 minutes, but suddenly at that point, just as you think you're finally going to have your turn, someone comes in with a heart attack. Who's going to be treated first? The person with the heart attack. During the Civil War, and we're an aid station, we, we don't do amputations, we don't do the big stuff. If someone comes in now and they have 
a dislocated finger, they have a, a cut on their hand, but it's not in any way threatening. We will take care of that one first. And the reason we're doing that first is once I get that, they get that started, they can bandage it, tell them what to do to take it. They get sent back to the unit. That's why I kept saying we're going to take them to the ambulance. The ones that we treated today risk infection. So they are going to come next. We're going to do what we can, but we're going to take them to the ambulance where the, if there is any chance that it needs to have an amputation, that's where they're going to do it. So triage, yes, they did, but you wouldn't have liked it very much. Even if they had mortal wounds, they were so blessed. They, uh, there's something, are you acquainted with the term a Joshua tree? It's uh, sometimes referred to as a Joshua tree, a dying tree. And we don't have any here, so I couldn't demonstrate a Joshua tree. Anyway, what would happen is that a soldier with a gut wound, they would make as comfortable as they possibly could. But if they had a steward or a nurse or whatever that could help could be taken away, they were going to take that person over to the tree where there's shade, make them as comfortable as possible. When the docs have finished all their surgeries and it's come down, they will go over and take a look at them and see if there's anything they can do for them. More than likely by that time, they're gone. You can't fix it. They knew enough that once you open an abdomen, and especially that one, he had a bowel. In modern medicine, I watch a lot of shows. <laughs> I'm not medical. Well, I was PTA, that doesn't count. Um, in modern medicine even, a perforated bowel is very dangerous. That requires immediate work. So, because you're putting all that nastiness in the whole system and that's not healthy. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. Um, I read in a, in, in a uh, historian book on the Civil War that sometimes they did use maggots and leeches to get rid of infection. Anything the answer is kind of yes and act a weird part of that. No. Modern medicine has discovered the use of mag maggots. Badly. If you have a compound fracture, you all know what a compound fracture is. Okay, when you have a compound fracture, the risk of infection soars. Mm -hmm. But you have to cast that leg. Now you have a cast on a leg with a compound fracture that you need to keep clean, but it's got a cast on it. So they have are actually raising <laughs> maggots and put them, they can put a maggot down in there because maggots will only eat dead flesh. I, it's possible that they were then, but again, it depends on when. Uh, you want to talk about leeches and the advantages of the leeches? Oh, who's in here? Bob, you want to talk about the leeches? Yeah, leeches! We're used to one of the ways to bleed a patient mm -hmm. is to use a leech. <coughs> it's fairly well controlled because the leech will only take as much blood as, and once it gets filled up, it just drops off. <laughs> as opposed to using, the term for a, a blood letter is a fleam, and to open a vein, and then just let a bunch of blood drip out. Now, in fact, uh, George Washington actually died not from his disease, but from being bled too much. Mm -hmm. so, um, they are using these today now too. Um, they have uh, something uh, in their saliva that actually deadens pain, or deadens, deadens the sensation. Um, it also helps to draw blood into a spot that might need it some more just to just to help get rid of some infection there. If you cut into a vein or an artery or something like that during a deep 
surgery or even an amputation. You had to do something to keep the blood flow stopped while you're doing the surgery. The leech will actually help the, bring the blood flow back. You had a question. What was, the, what was their rationale for blood flow? It predates us. Let's put it this way. Prior to the Civil War, most medical people were following medieval tradition. Sounds they were still like bloodletting, they were still <laughs> using yeah. leeches for various and sundry things. It didn't really matter. Uh, they would, yeah, it was nasty. It was really, really archaic. At the beginning of the Civil War, the Surgeon General, the new Surgeon General, asked, I think, or said, we need new medical books. We need our doctors on more up-to-date things. The, the one that he either replaced or in that reign said, no, we don't. We're fine with what we've got. Those medical books still had bleeding. It took the Civil War. The one thing that I will say, I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. Those of you who are older, you know who Pollyanna is. The rest of you don't. I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. If I can find a positive thing in it, in something, I will. The only positive thing I can ever think that comes from war is that medical care increases by leaps and bounds. And the Civil War is no different. In fact, in one way, it might be better. The documentation of Civil War medicine is mammoth. The wounds that you saw the Doc Bach operating on have been documented. They actually happened. And we have a friend, uh, well now he lives in Gettysburg, but lived in Illinois, that trained us that he does brain surgery to relieve pressure on the brain, uh, a place where the eye has popped out and he puts the eye back in, and another one that he lovingly refers to as TikTok, where a bullet hit the guy's pocket watch and pushed it into his body. Those are all documented cases. It's amazing. Anything? 